and gentlemen, James Franco. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm James Franco, actor, poet, artist, dude. And don't forget, creep, a fucking creep. Now to some of you watching, you've known that James Franco is a creep for a long time, but to others, this is all news to you. And whether you're new to the James Franco creep train or a long time passenger, stay tuned, as I'll lay out why James Franco is a creep in this mental episode of Now before I begin, I want to quickly state my reason for making this video. Just so the idiots out there don't have an opportunity to speculate themselves. The goal of my video is to shine a light on all the shitty things James Franco has done, because prior to making this video, I wasn't aware of all the shady shit revolving around him. Now I'd always been a fan of James Franco. His collaborations with Seth Rogen had consistently led to some of my favorite comedies over the last 20 years, including Pineapple Express and This Is The End. I also think Franco was incredible in both 127 Hours and The Disaster Artist, as he showed that Beneath that stupid persona of his, he's actually a very talented actor who can carry a movie with his acting skills alone. With that said, I think the reason why I wasn't aware of any of the problematic stuff revolving around Frankel for so long is due to the fact that he's consistently had a larger platform than those he has harmed. He has been able to deny or at the very least downplay the accusations against him, with his victims not receiving the same platform to respond and make their own case. You can call it white privilege, but I'm going to call it being rich, successful, and good looking privilege. Now that I got that out of the way, let's get right into this video. So there's a lot of ways one can be a creep. They could be one of those people who makes eye contact with the dentist while they're cleaning their mouth. They could be one of those people who eat potato chips on top of the bag. Or they could be one of those people who tip ridiculous amounts of money to their favorite e-girls in hopes of hooking up with them. And there's the creeps who try to have sex with people that are way too young for them. Which is exactly the type of creep James Franco is. So even though we can't be certain when Franco's lust for girls half his age started, the very first transgression that went public was in April 2014, when screenshots were published of Franco sending lewd messages to a 17-year-old girl. Lucy Claude, who is the girl that James Franco was inappropriately messaging, was a Scottish student visiting New York City as an early present for her 18th birthday. During her trip to New York, Lucy attended Franco's Broadway musical of Mice and Men, and after the event stuck around to see Franco leave the theater, along with some pictures. Lucy recorded a video of Franco, in which we could hear Franco asking Lucy to tag him in her post. You gotta tag me. Later that night, Franco started messaging Lucy through Instagram and eventually through iMessage. I'll give you a moment to read their exchange yourself before taking a deeper dive into some of the individual messages. So as you can see, this is some really creepy behavior from Franco. The first place we could say that Franco definitely crossed the line was his seventh message, in which he asked Lucy do you have a boyfriend? He goes on to ask what's your number, which Lucy evidently gives to Franco since they continue their exchange through iMessage. Franco goes on to really cross the line, and in some jurisdictions, commit a felony by asking Lucy can I see you and should I rent a room in the hotel she was staying at. Lucy expresses doubt that she is really messaging James Franco, with Franco responding with a selfie in an effort to prove his identity, and what we must presume since these the only screenshots out there. Lucy doesn't respond to Franco's request of meeting up, and he says to her okay and be well. Lucy insists that she'll come back when she's 18, and that she can't wait to tell her friends back in Scotland about it all. Franco asks Lucy not to tell anyone, with Lucy responding that she won't tell if he gives proper evidence that it's really him she's messaging. Franco refuses and tries ending the exchange, but Lucy raises the stakes, telling Franco that she'll meet up with him if he sends an image of himself holding a piece of paper with her name on it. And being the teen craving perv that he is, does just that. So now that we had a chance to examine their messages, you might be wondering, how did this exchange ever become public? Well Lucy herself posted screenshots on Twitter, with a now deleted tweet spreading across the platform like wildfire. Even though we can't be sure what Lucy's motives were for tweeting their exchange, 
Given the context clues, including the message on her tweet that rejecting James Franco has to be the hardest thing I've ever done, and the fact that she showed interest in Franco, such as this response as to whether or not she had a boyfriend and insisting that she'd come back when she was 18. I think this was a simple case of a teenage girl wanting to show off to her friends, that an attractive celebrity like James Franco found her attractive, and that she had the willpower to turn him down. As far as we know, this is where their exchange ended, because according to both Franco and Lucy, the pair never met after the Broadway play, and because they never met, we can only speculate why Lucy sent her last message. Did she genuinely plan on meeting up with Franco but backed out at the last minute? Did she never plan on meeting up with Franco and was just baiting switching him? Or was it some other motive that I'm not even considering? In the end, all we can really do is speculate why Lucy tweeted the messages. And it doesn't really matter why she did. Because even though she might have made some questionable decisions along the way, Franco is the one who needs to answer for his actions, not Lucy. This is because as far as I'm concerned, if Lucy didn't reject Franco the way that she did, this would have been another EDP 445 situation all over again. And even though that's a whole another can of worms that I'm not going to open up in this video. There's one similarity between EDP's case and Franco's. That being both involve online solicitation of a minor. According to the Library of Congress U.S. Code 18 Section 2422, federal online solicitation of minors to entice or coerce someone younger than 18 years of age to engage in sexual activity. To engage in sexual activity can range from adult having sexual conversations with a minor, sending or requesting sexual content from a minor, suggesting or agreeing to meet up with a minor for sexual reasons, all the way to having sexual interaction with a minor. The more egregious the infraction, the more likely the individuals will be found guilty of online solicitation of a minor. On top of this, each state has their own online solicitation of a minor laws, which differ from the federal law in key ways. The primary reason for this difference is that age of consent differs from state to state. For a visual representation, here's a map of all the ages of consent across the United States. As you can see, a large majority of states have an age of consent of only 16, 31 states to be exact, with 7 states having an age of consent of 17, and 12 states having an age of consent of 18. Now you might be wondering, how the fuck can a state have a lower age of consent than the federal government? Well, long story short, states with their own self-governing bodies and can establish their own laws as long as they don't restrict the freedoms granted by the U.S. Constitution or its 27 amendments. And a state having a lower age of consent than the federal government is permitted, as the state is granting more freedoms rather than restricting it. So voila, 16-year-olds can have sex now, just what the founding fathers would have wanted. Well, probably, as most of them were creeps too. Okay, so if a state's age of consent is lower than the federal government's age of consent, when does the federal government's age of consent and in turn laws for online solicitation of a minor kick in? After a solid hour of research, I finally found the answer to this question provided by Justin Calicamarian, a defense attorney for Barry Law Firm based in Nebraska, who I'm sure is thrilled to be featured in my dumbass video. This is what he had to say about the key difference between a federal offense and a state offense of the same crime. In a federal case, uh, there has to be a nexus between um, different states or, or different traveling between two different states or committing crimes in different states and the crime itself. Whereas a state case uh, tends to happen all entirely within that state. This was actually a key part I left out in the code that I mentioned earlier. which also specifies using the mail or any facility of means of interstate or foreign commerce to more or less hook up with someone under 18 years old. See, I pulled a sneaky on you. It's not that I pulled a sneaky on you. It's just that I thought it'd be less confusing if I revealed that part of the code later. And in case you're wondering, in situations where individual breaks both federal and state versions of a law, a person can in fact be charged with the same crime twice, and it's not considered double jeopardy, as there's two different governments that are handing out the punishments. Pretty stupid, I know, but... That's the way it was. And that's the way the cookie crumbles. So now that I got all that legal jargon out of the way, how does this all tie in with James Franco's situation with 17-year-old Lucy in New York? Referring to the Library of Congress a second time, New York Penal Law Section 235.22 states that online solicitation of a minor is disseminating indecent material to minors via computer communication system and using such communication to invite or induce a minor for sexual conduct or contact, which is exactly what James Franco did. So he's guilty, right? We can finally lock up the smug bastard? Well, no, because as you might have noticed when looking at the age of consent map. New York has an age of consent of only 17, and as a result, the state of New York considers a person a minor only if they're under the age of 17, rather than 18 like the federal government does. So even though what James Franco did was creepy, inappropriate, and illegal in 12 states, it was totally legal within the arbitrary borders of New York State. As Lucy met New York's legal age of consent, and all their interactions occurred only in New York and didn't cross any state borders, explain why the feds didn't kick down Franco's door when the messages went public. 
Even if the feds tried incorporating an international aspect of Lucy being a Scotland resident visiting New York, the agent could sit in Scotland 16. So whether if it took place in New York or in Scotland, Franco's creepy and totally inappropriate behavior of Lucy would have been totally legal. And how did James Franco respond to all of this? Well, the first thing he did was post his image on Instagram, with the caption suggesting that it was Lucy and her parents' fault for him trying to hook up with a girl half his age. He also added, please don't DM me if you're under 18 to his Instagram bio. Because, you know, you can't tempt a predator. He also made an appearance on Killing Michael, where everything that's wrong with the situation can be seen in a little over a minute. And uh, now, we, we know you've been in the news this morning, yeah. and uh, it's our understanding that it's something that you wanted to address. So, uh, I mean, yours. I just didn't, you know, I was just feeling awkward. I didn't want to come on the show and just feel awkward. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, you know, I'm embarrassed, and I, uh, I guess I'm just a model of, you know, how social media is tricky you know it's a it's a way people meet each other today but what i've learned i guess just because i'm new to it it's like you don't know who's on the other end you meet somebody in person and you you know you you get a feel for them but you don't know who you're talking to and right you know so i use bad judgment and it i learned my lesson but unfortunately in my position i mean i have a very good life but not only do I have to go through the embarrassing kind of rituals of meeting someone, sometimes if I do that, it, then it gets, you know, published for the world. So now, I, you know, it's like doubly embarrassing, but well, anyway. Well, you know, I think the way you came out here and handled it is, per is perfectly mm -hmm. acceptable. It happens to everybody, and I think it happens to... Uh, movie stars on a much grander scale like you just said because everybody knows who you are and I promise I will not reveal our text messages <laughs> thank you Well, where to begin, huh? Well, other than the fact that he admits to try and hook up with a 17-year-old girl, the first thing that he tries to do is shift public sympathy towards himself by saying, Not only do I have to go through the embarrassing kind of rituals of meeting someone, sometimes if I do that, then it gets, you know, published for the world. So now, I, you know, it's like doubly embarrassing. He also tries hiding behind the excuse that social media is tricky and that he's new to it. Social media is tricky, you know. It's a, it's a way people meet each other today. But what I've learned, I guess just because I'm new to it, it's like... But considering the fact that he had made over 2,000 Instagram posts and had over 1.5 million followers when this whole incident occurred, it's safe to say that he knew social media like the back of his hand, and that he was full of shit by saying otherwise. You also can't convince me that when Franco asked Lucy to tag him in her post, that he didn't know it was a slick way to get access to her account so that he could message her later. And along with trying to shift public sympathy towards himself, Franco tries shifting blame towards Lucy. You don't know who's on the other end. You meet somebody in person and you, you know, you, you get a feel for them, but you don't know who you're talking to. And right. Well, James, you knew her name was Lucy, that she was 17 years old, that she was from Scotland, and that she was visiting New York as an early present for 18th birthday. What do you mean you didn't know her? Oh, you mean you didn't think she was the type of person to post your creepy ass trying to hook up with a girl half your age on the internet for everyone to see? Oh, okay, it all makes sense now. And Kelly Ripa, God, she was awful. You know, I think the way you came out here and handled it is per is perfectly mm -hmm. acceptable. It happens to everybody, and I think it happens to uh, movie stars on a much grander scale, like you just said, because everybody knows who you are. And I promise I will not reveal our text messages. <laughs> Thank you. Other than the fact that, no, not everyone tries hooking up with people half their age. Her little joke about not sharing the messages perfectly highlights the special treatment Franco receives because people think that he's hot. It just highlight the dumb, thirsty fandom of teenage girls that follow James Franco everywhere that he goes. Here's just a handful of dumb, thirsty comms defending James Franco and vilifying Lucy that I saw while researching for this video. A 17 year old girl flirting with James Franco. What a scandal. Guess a million other teenage girls would never think of doing the same. I would have gone to meet him like what's wrong with this girl. He is such an amazing person, and damn I don't know what to say. She was turning 18 in a month. A month people. I guarantee no one would have made a big deal if this happened just a month later. And it's not like James is like 60. He's in his 30s. Big deal. Either way, I'm very jealous of that girl and annoyed. Come on girl. James freaking Franco wanted to meet you, and you go and tell everyone. Seriously. 
And that's another thing that I wanted to address. Because even if Lucy was 18 when Franco messaged her, it'd still be creepy. Because at 35 years old, he'd still be almost twice as old as she was. Along with people's tendency to defend Franco's creepy behavior because they think he was funny, cute, or a combination of both most of the time, there was some doubt thrown as well as to whether or not Franco's exchange with Lucy ever happened at all. As the movie star and Franco titled Paulo Alto was released the following month in May. The reason for this is that Paulo Alto tells the story of an older soccer coach played by Franco, getting into a relationship with a younger soccer player depicted by Emma Roberts. Needless to say, Paulo Alto's plot paralleled with Franco's real life transgressions to a T. And because of it, many people thought that Franco and Lucy's exchange was made up and part of some shady publicity stunt to promote the movie. And considering that Paulo Alto is based on a short story collection written by Franco himself in 2010, it's interesting that an older man who likes younger girls like Franco would write a story about an older man liking younger girls. It's also interesting that Franco would depict the same older man in the movie, where he got to shoot sex scenes with Emma Roberts who is 13 years younger than him and was only 21 at the time of filming. More and more, Franco is sounding like Matthew McConaughey's character in Dazed and Confused. That's what I love about these high school girls, man. I get older, they stay the same age. <laughs> yes, they do. God. Yes, they do. <laughs> And before shifting the discussion to more recent transgressions of James Franco being a creep, remember that SNL intro that I showed at the beginning of the video? Well, that episode aired in December 2014, eight months after Franco tried hooking up with Lucy. And here's a joke that Franco figured would be funny and appropriate to tell during his monologue. So, something pretty crazy happened this week. Uh, I have this movie called The Interview coming out with Seth Rogen at Sony, and this week Sony Studios got all their computers hacked. This is true. All right, let's just fast forward a little bit. Oh yeah, did I mention that Franco's bestest friend Seth Rogen was in this monologue? Don't worry, people. I'll get to him before this is all over. And... Oh, and also, all the girls who got any Instagram messages from me this year, last year, the hackers did it! It was the hackers! As promised, let's shift to some of Franco's more recent transgressions. In 2014, Franco started Studio 4, an acting and filmmaking school where simultaneous directing and acting in films taught some of its classes. Along with providing an environment where students could focus solely on film, Studio 4 was designed to be a springboard for students to start off their acting, writing, and directing careers. As Rabbit Bandini, James Franco's very own production company, would hire Studio 4 students to work in their productions. Despite teaching and mentoring hundreds of students, Studio 4 abruptly closed its doors in October 2017. And even though actors are a little <laughs> It's not a crime to open up an acting school, and you'll see why I brought this all up in a minute. In 2017, Franco's film The Disaster Artist was released, chronicling the creation of the best worst movie ever made in 2003's The Room. For his depiction of The Room's eccentric director, writer, and lead actor Tommy Wiseau, Franco received a Golden Globe Award, the second of his acting career. On January 7th, during the Golden Globe 75th Annual Award Show, Franco wore a Time's Up pin to show support of the Me Too movement. During his acceptance speech, some tweets accusing Franco of sexual harassment went viral, including this tweet by Sarah Tither Kaplan, one of Franco's former Studio 4 acting students, and this tweet by Violet Paley, an aspiring film writer and Franco's former girlfriend. Ali Sheedy, who most famously played Allison in The Breakfast Club, also made some incriminating tweets about Franco, only to delete them later that night. Three days later, on January 10th, Franco made an appearance on Stephen Colbert. While there, Franco claimed that I have no idea what I did to Ali Sheedy, and that Sarah and Violet's accusations against him were not accurate, making sure not to mention their names so that he was in turn not denying any specific accusations against them. And despite making this great old spiel about not being able to live with himself with this restitution to be made, Franco turns around and while on Seth Meyers the following night, states that he hadn't reached out to Ali Sheedy to learn her perspective, so that he could in turn figure out if there was restitution to be made with her. You know, the restitution he oh so cared about the previous night? In between these two appearances, the Los Angeles Times published an article that featured five women accusing Franco of being sexually inappropriate or exploitative towards them, with Sarah and Violet being two of the five women featured. One egregious thing that Franco had done according to Sarah was during a nude sex scene featuring herself and Franco. He removed plastic guards covering other actresses' vaginas while simulating oral sex on them. To be fair, Franco has never admitted to doing this, and no evidence of him doing has ever surfaced, so it's his word against Sarah's. But just for hypothetical reasons, Reasons. Let's imagine this actually happens. Now I know that there are some actors out there who just completely lose themselves in the characters they're portraying, and that there must be absolutely no distractions for them to be at their best. But removing a genital guard? Seriously? Like other than the fact that it's a complete evasion of someone's body, what could Franco's excuse in that situation possibly be? Oh I can't eat a pussy right unless I can see it. 
is bullshit. It's bullshit. This just seems like one of those scenarios so crazy that no one could have possibly made it up and it had to have happened. Sarah also said this orgy scene was deemed a bonus scene and to both her and the other actresses seemed totally slapped on and had little to no relevance to the plot. Sarah also accounted another unscripted scene involving nudity where she and a few other female co-stars danced around Franco topless while wearing animal skulls on top of their heads and that when one of the girls balked at the idea was sent home the following day. Seriously, what type of fucking movie is this? Seems like just an excuse for Franco to surround himself with naked women, doesn't it? Remember how I said that Studio 4 students would receive the opportunity to work in James Franco's productions? Even though it's true that Studio 4 students did in fact receive roles in James Franco's films, they were all small insignificant roles paid like shit and most of them required nudity. This ties right into the tweet that Sarah made during the Golden Globes, where she said she got paid only $100 a day for full nudity. Sarah would go on to express regret in starring these movies by saying, now if you google me, you can see me naked, before I ever been on TV before I ever had any real credits. Philo was also featured in the LA Times article, and referring to the tweet that she made during the Golden Globes, said that she did in fact engage in a sexual act in the car, as he was kind of nudging my head down, and I didn't want him to hate me. Now I know this is really obvious for some of you, but for others it's not, but uh, don't pressure someone into doing a sexual act for you. I mean, if they're doing it without you having to ask, then they obviously want to do it. Which is great, everyone's happy. And of course, if they're your significant other, you can ask them to do that sexual act for you. But if they don't definitively say, yes, I'll do this for you, then let it go. Put your ego to the side and don't ask them a second time. This is a little sum called consent. Also worth mentioning is the fact that Violet's 16 years younger than Franco, which is more evidence that James Franco is in fact thirsty for underage ones. To be fair, Violet was 21 at the time, so she wasn't underage. Age. But a 37 year old dating a 21 year old? Come on now. Now if Franco and Violet met when he was 66 and she was 50, make it for the same 16 year age gap. Their relationship would be totally acceptable in comparison, as the percent difference between their ages wouldn't be as dramatic. But in 2016 when Franco was 37 and Violet was 21, Franco was nearly twice as old as Violet, which is just a little too weird of a relationship in my book. Some of you out there might be thinking that Violet was a grown woman that she could love anyone that she wants. Now I'm not saying that Violet was wrong for being a relationship with Franco. What I am saying though is that Franco was wrong for being in a relationship with Violet. Regardless of what you think of James Franco, general consensus says that he's a rich, funny, good looking, successful guy and because of it has a plethora of girls that would love to be in a relationship with him. So there's really no excuse for him to go after girls that are half his age. Even if he wasn't rich, funny, good looking, and successful, what does a 37 year old and a 21 year old really have in common? I get it, men are more attractive to younger girls because they can bear more children and all that other Jordan Peterson, Sigmund Freud sounding crap, but there comes a point with the older individual in a relationship, who needless to say is almost always a man, has to grow the fuck up and say no to dating people half their age. Because as the older individual, they're supposed to be the more responsible one. Alright, I'll get off my soapbox now. In October 2019, Almost two years after the LA Times article was published, two former female Studio 4 students, one of them being Sarah, filed a lawsuit against Franco for sexual misconduct and exploitation. According to an article published by the New York Times, the lawsuit say that Franco subjected his students to sexually exploitive auditions and film shoots, and that Studio 4 was little more than a scheme to provide him and his male collaborators with a pool of young female performers that they could take advantage of. Now this lawsuit is taking place in civil court rather than criminal court, and there's some key differences between the two that I want all of you to understand. In criminal court, somebody is being accused of a criminal offense, while in civil court, somebody is being accused of a civil offense. Punishments for criminal offenses can include fines, prison time, and in extreme cases, execution. While for civil offenses, the only possible punishment is fines. In criminal court, a person is found either guilty or not guilty of committing an offense. While in civil court, they're found either liable or not liable. In criminal court, for somebody to be found guilty of a criminal offense, it must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt that they committed the offense, which to give a rough percentage, is about 95% certain. While in civil court for somebody to be found liable of a civil offense, the preponderance of the evidence standard must be met, which is pretty much a fancy way of saying that the person more likely not committed the offense, or 51%. Sexual harassment is an umbrella term for all sexually inappropriate behavior, with sexual assault being a criminal offense, and sexual misconduct being a civil offense. And because the woman who filed the lawsuit were accused in Franco of sexual misconduct, there were looking to sue Franco rather than send him to prison. I mean, if they could send Franco to prison, they probably would. But since sexual misconduct is only a civil offense, they couldn't send Franco to prison even if they wanted to. In February 2021, the lawsuit was settled with both women dropping their claims. How much money they were seeking and how much money they ultimately received is unknown at this time, as many of the details revolving around the case haven't been made available to the public. So since Franco settled with a woman, can we take this as an admission of guilt? I mean, if he hadn't done anything wrong, he would have stood his ground and not gave either of them a penny, right? 
right? Well, no, we can't, as there are a lot of reasons why people might settle a lawsuit rather than go through the whole legal process. Lawsuits are incredibly time consuming and lawyers are expensive, so much so that in a lot of cases, by the time the winning side pays their lawyers, there's nothing left over for them to have. On the flip side, perhaps with his history of making bad choices with women in the past, Franco figured that he would be found liable anyway, and rather than going through the whole legal process of defending himself, just pay the women some, if not all, the damages they were seeking. Or perhaps Franco was guilty of sexual misconduct and exploitation, and just settled with the women so that the lawsuit would receive as little media coverage as possible. And as promised, let's talk about Seth Rogen. So Franco and Seth have been seemingly best friends since 1999 with both starred in the TV series Freaks and Geeks. And since Freaks and Geeks, Seth and Franco have starred in eight movies together, most notably Pineapple Express, This Is The End, The Interview, and Sausage Party. And with these four movies grossing over $250 million combined at the box office, I guess we could say that Seth and Franco are an inseparable duo, right? You're wrong! That's because during an interview given last month to the Sunday Times, Seth said that he currently has no plans of working with Franco again. When asked if he believed the accusations against Franco, Seth gave a non-answer, saying that I despise abuse and harassment, and I would never cover or conceal the actions of someone doing it, or knowingly put someone in a situation where they're around someone like that. He also expressed regret for this joke that he made during an SNL monologue that took place less than two weeks after Franco tried hooking up with Lucy. I decided to prank James Franco. I posed as a girl on Instagram, <laughs> told him I was way young. He seemed unfazed. I have a date to meet him at the Ace Hotel. And just because he's great at making rational decisions, Franco figured that it'd be really funny if he had a part in the joke too. I just wanted to say, great prank, buddy. I've been waiting at the Ace Hotel for like three days. Okay, well, okay. We'll talk about that later. We'll talk about that later. Okay, well, bye, everybody. <laughs> So what changed? Did quarantine make Seth realize how much of a creep and asshole James Franco is? Perhaps so. But one thing we could definitely say is that Charlene Yee, who starred alongside Franco and Seth in Disaster Artist, definitely sped up Seth's public outing of Franco. This is because in April, Charlene posted on her Instagram page after hearing rumors that Franco was a sexual predator. She tried quitting the Disaster Artist. But in doing so, the production team tried bribing her with a bigger role in the movie. And considering that Seth was the producer of the film, had to have known about the bribe. Charlene also made mention of Seth's joke of Franco trying to have sex with a 17 year old one month before his interview with the Sunday Times. So whether he was expressing regret for victims of sexual harassment for making that joke, or expressing regret for himself, is uncertain. I agree with Charlene that Seth needs to be held accountable for enabling, normalizing, and covering up Franco's shitty, predatory behavior. Now, Seth is definitely not as guilty or as liable as Franco, because after all, an accessory to a crime does not and should not receive the same punishment as the person who commits the crime itself. But considering the extent that Seth enabled, normalized, and covered up Franco's predatory behavior, he definitely needs to do more than simply not work with Franco again. With his wealth and connections, one thing Seth could do is give Franco's victims the same platform he had to shoot down their accusations before they even had a chance to leave the ground, including talk shows like Kelly and Michael, now Kelly and Ryan, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, and Late Night with Seth Meyers. This is because the Me Too movement was never about always believing in sexual harassment victims, but giving them access to the same platforms their abusers had to make their case and refute the argument their abusers were making. Hold on, I'm getting a call on the invisible Bluetooth earpiece I've had in my ear this entire time. Oh hey Seth Rogen, what's up? <laughs> So you're saying that we can't do that because the shows won't invite those guests? Is it the number one goal is to make money and that the people behind them don't actually give a shit about equality and justice? <laughs> well, never mind. At least we tried, right boys? So what are some takeaways that we can have from this video? Well, other than the fact that James Franco likes fooling around with girls that are way too young for him, and that his behavior towards women has been unacceptable and downright predatorial over the last seven years, James Franco has gone away pretty scot-free with everything he's done so far. This is in large part because his thirsty, obsessive fan base thinks he can do no wrong, and in part because he has consistently had larger platforms than his victims to state his case and refute their own. Again, the only thing that Franco has downright admitted to so far is trying to hook up with Lucy. But considering this problematic president he said himself, I think we can agree that James Franco probably did sexually harass and exploit Violet, Sarah, and many other students who enrolled in Studio 4. Now I'm not saying that James Franco should be locked up, because despite all the shitty stuff he's done, none of it was criminal offenses in respects to where it occurred. If you believe that Franco should be criminally charged and locked up for trying to hook up with a 17 year old girl or sexually exploiting Sarah and Violet, it's your right to believe that. What I am saying though is that more attention should be brought to Franco's shitty actions, so that actresses that do work with him in the future can be properly warned of his presence 
predatorial tendencies. And even though some people out there would still love James Franco be killed a litter of puppies on live television, as more people learn about his transgressions, his fandom will decrease in its size and ability to influence public perception in favor of Franco. We'll have to wait and see if Seth keeps his word of not working with Franco ever again, and if so, what effect he'll have on Franco's career. Who knows, maybe one day Franco could be essentially blacklisted from Hollywood the same way Kevin Spacey has been blacklisted for being a fucking creep himself. Considering that most of Franco's work not alongside Seth or a great director like Danny Boyle has been pretty shitty so far, if Seth keeps his word, it might prove to be the beginning of the end of Franco's career. And along with Seth apologizing to the woman that he allowed Franco to sexually harass and exploit, what more could we ask for? I think this video goes to explain why Franco didn't get sucked up to heaven and this is the end. Fuck you! <laughs> Suck my dick! Ah! Oh! No, James Franco. Fuck you and suck my dick. So if you made it to this point in my video, thank you for watching. If you liked this video, please give it a like and comment as well because it helps me and my channel a lot. And if you'd like to watch my future videos, please subscribe if you haven't already. So yeah, this is it for this video and uh, until next time. Provided there is a next time for any of us.